Joining me today are a number of my friends and colleagues and co-hackers, Rob Pugliese, Glenn, where, where's Glenn? He's back, way back there. Um, for any, who else has done a hack besides us guys? All right, so yeah, so we've got, we've got some hackers. We've got some hackers in the audience. For those of you who have not done a hack, let me strongly urge you to, to join us for our hackathon next November. We haven't set it up yet, but it will be in November. But it's people like Aisha that drove the hacking vision from MIT. MIT and, that, and hacking, oh, where, oh, there it is. Oh, I'm, I have your opening slide up, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's fine? Okay. So um, Aisha, along with uh, Zen Chu, some really extraordinary MIT students and postdocs, they are remaking the world of hacking, starting at MIT and moving it around the world. For those of us who actually had to learn how to do a hack, that's where I got my first hacking experience was at MIT. I remember signing up and, and they were saying, well, you know, you could, you know, you, you could be a, a mentor. And I'm thinking, you want me to be a mentor? I don't know anything about this. But it turns out I know a lot about a lot of other stuff, and so I was a mentor from my very first hacking experience. Those of you who know Bon Ku, you probably know he actually joined a team, um, and they about killed him because they worked all night. So, um, so the hacking experience is extraordinary. If you hadn't, haven't done it, um, Aisha is going to be walking you through why you should. And I'm just so delighted that she got on an early flight from Boston, made, did a late night surgery last night, was supposed to come down last night, but managed to make it here this morning to join all of us to talk about uh, MIT hacking and moving, it, moving hacking okay. around the world. She's amazing. She's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Too kind. Too kind of an introduction. <laughs> um, perfect. I'll use the clicker. To go. Okay, perfect. So. Thank you guys for coming. So just for me to have a little bit of an idea uh, of who's in the audience, um, raise your hand if you're a student at Jefferson. Okay, so we've got a good group of students. And then raise your hand if you're faculty or clinician at Jefferson. Okay, good. And then raise your hand if you're a basic science researcher. I'm guessing as to who the, aha, aha. And then what do the rest of you do? Like, what do you do, sir? Perfect, okay, so we've got a pretty diverse group. Uh, so my goal today, when Donna asked about speaking to you guys today, the, the goal is really to, to try to, and I, I'll, I can walk around now because I have my mic. Um, my goal is to walk you through two things, right? And she wanted to say, like, how does one put together an event and what is a hackathon and what does it mean? But my other goal is really to inspire you guys to life hack in your own work situation, right? And we know, and we'll talk about where the term comes from and why it's important and why it's gaining popularity, but we also know, for me as a clinician, so I'm an ear, nose, and throat physician, I know that there's a lot of things that I see in the workplace around me that I want to change, but it wasn't until I started meeting with this group of engineers that I had the ability to access people that could make things for me to change the process. So, so really, if you, if you marry that in, I guess raise your hands if you either have worked in a hospital or are a student that, you know, raise your hands if you have experience in the healthcare setting. Let's go that way. Yeah, and so that's the majority of you, right? And we all know that the following is true. What holds true in the rest of the world, so for example, we all have our smartphone and our gadgets and we use technology for a variety of things. And for some reason, when we come into hospital settings, we have so many antiquated systematic processes and we don't even know where they started or where they came from. So the purpose of today is to help you rethink about why you went into healthcare and what that mission was, and then sort of pull back and say, at a hackathon, you can suspend what currently exists and think about recreating and redesigning things for the way that they sh maybe should be for ourselves or for our patients. Uh, so I just, I have two folks to mention here. I have MIT Hacking Medicine. So I, I did an MBA and during that time, we, we've really grown the MIT Hacking Medicine group uh, and really literally have been traveling around the world. We've been to 10 plus countries at this point. And we've also exported the mission to Yale. And so there's a center for biomedical innovation and technology at Yale. And Donna was kind enough to come to the last hackathon at Yale a few weeks ago and, uh, and join in that growth as well. So we're kind of excited that the ecosystem is growing. 
And this is what I was referring to, right? That there are huge shifts and we often feel like we're floating between the things we have to get done through the day and the pressures that we face. And across healthcare, we know that change is happening and particularly across the Affordable Care Act or whatever you turn on the news, there's so much going on in healthcare. We don't know what the future holds. And if that breeds anxiety for us, as healthcare practitioners or consumers, it certainly brings anxiety for our patients. And that's one of the reasons that we think our mission is very important. But there is some philosophical thinking around why hacking medicine thinks that this process of hacking is so important. And we'll come back to what the term means um, and, and sort of where it comes from. But I want you to look here on something that's very important. We know that the medical insight, the way that we do things in healthcare, is increasingly tied to the business of healthcare, right? So you're in a health system. I know as a clinician, there's always a drive for volume. There's always a drive to see more patients or you know, keep them healthy. It used to be do more surgeries, now it's keep them healthy. And really what's better for the patient is preventing surgeries. But there's also this technical innovation and sometimes there's a little bit of a rub between more technology but then how does it actually help me like one-on-one -on -one communicate with a patient better? And, and for us, that's often hard to do. And that's where it comes from. And this is probably the slide I should have had up when, uh, when Donna was speaking earlier, but this is the hackathon she came to, the first one that she came to, and she'll recognize it. It's the top of the media lab. And we'll talk about the fact that the most important component, I will state it up front, of any hackathon event in any field is coffee. <laughs> You must have a large amount of coffee. And as the folks know with the recent one that I helped coordinate at Yale, I was very convinced that we must never run out of some caffeinated beverages for the hackers. So where does the word hack come from? Um, so the reason we were talking about MIT is hackathons are actually not new to other industries. And the word hack just means a clever solution. It actually doesn't mean digging into your private data through an airline or your credit card or your bank, which is the connotation that it's come to have. But physically speaking, it means that you find a way to do something in a different approach, and sometimes you use the tools that are around you. And so I don't know if everyone here knew that, but it doesn't mean doing things upside down. It just means doing things with what resources are available. And I think that becomes particularly important for global health. And it was particularly important in the naming of the hacking medicine group. The other thing we think about is that there's an equation for impact, right? So we don't just want to create new technologies. We actually want them to translate. I, having done a lot of basic science research myself, you want to bring things from the bench to the bedside. And it's often a struggle to say, how am I going to translate that to something meaningful for our patients? Well, in the same way, you might come up with a germ of an idea or a prototype at a hackathon event, but really what you want to do is think about how is this going to be in the hands of more than a few people. And our measurement of impact, like everything else at MIT, there's an equation. So really we want to see invention, but at these events we want to see commercialization. And believe it or not, I've gotten pushback from some of the patient councils, even at this Yale event, saying, tell me what that means. Does that mean that you know, the invention should only be about making money? No, that's not the case. But the case is, unless it has a sustainable business model, we don't know that your project is really going to go forward. Um, and I think that's a big learning for, for folks, particularly, raise your hands for the medical students. Oftentimes, the medical students come up with the most brilliant ideas. The undergrads come up with the most brilliant ideas and they'll say, look, you nurse practitioner want to use this. And of course you're gonna wanna use it because it's better for your patients. And you know, the physician or the nurse practitioner says, I don't want to use anything that adds 30 seconds to my day. Like give me a reason why I wanna do it. So it has to fit, right? It has to fit either the betterment of the patient, the incentive alignment for the health system, and that's kind of what we're trying to bring together. And then we, I think it, it applies not just in wearables, but it actually applies in medical devices. So some of our most recent hackathon events have been with larger companies really looking at just because you bring a new tool to the market, like a portable ultrasound, like we had at the last year's event at MIT, 
How can you then provide the data and the information to clinicians and to patients so that they are not dependent on bringing it back to the company to do that analysis? Which I think was very bold of a company like GE to do that. Let us open up the technology for you so we can think about increasing usage globally, despite the fact that in the short term we may not be selling all of that at a high price, but in the long term we want utilization for our product. And we'll talk about that. And we know, raise your hands if you use a Fitbit or a, a smartphone to track, right? I, so I, I use it, I use it periodically, right? I go through these spurts like, okay, I'm gonna be running and I'm gonna be tracking with my friends. I think the market on wearables has allowed maybe an acceptance or an over acceptance of technology. But I think what is very clear to us um, at Hacking Medicine is it hasn't necessarily translated to better health, like for the consumer or the patient. And I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes what compliance looks like for patients that are given medications or tools. And so we have a lot of things that are in the market and yet we're not healthier as a nation for the most part. And so we wanna ask those kinds of questions. This is actually, a student, uh, she's graduated now, but, but this is a real person at MIT, but she's not wearing all these things just, just to be wearing them. She was trying to do this sort of data collection on herself to serve as an example and to look at reliability and consistency. But one could ask the question, is that what people will look like in the future? And really, who wants to look like that or even have something physical that denotes that they have a disease? I'll give you an example of this. So we did a hackathon a year ago in Singapore, and that was um, with the Singaporean government because they were looking at how the elderly could better age in the home. Because obviously there's space constrained, and not only that, but people like to stay in their home. And you know, we started talking to them about wearables, and they said, you know what? In our culture, in the Asian culture, like even more so, people don't want to denote that they're sick, let alone be wearing something with a sensor. So how can we embed technology within the household? So for example, a mat that senses walking. So if your parent has not gone and turned on the stove and the sensor on the stove like stays on, it'll send an alarm. Or if, they, if there's a couple of mats around the house, and somebody who's older hasn't stepped on any of them, then you start to worry, like have they fallen or are they feeling well? And I think that's the perfect marriage that we wanna see coming out of these events as ideas that then can be commercialized down the road. Um, and then this is the last slide I'll show about sort of the principles and then I'll jump right into, you know, what does it look like and what happens? But this is probably not new for anyone who's a clinician in the group, compliance for, medication adherence is terrible in our country, in the world. Nobody wants to take things chronically and long term. And in fact, the numbers, this, is a, this data is a little bit old, but the numbers are so interesting because whether you have um, diabetes or breast cancer, if after three to six months, it just all drops. For me in particular, this is for sleep apnea patients. Like the patients I see with sleep apnea, everybody tries it. Nobody loves it, who loves the current version of the CPAP machine, which looks like an astronaut device. Um, and after a few months, most people tend not to use it. So I think those are some of the reasons why everyone in here is gonna be meeting engineers and computer scientists and builders to come up with just a better version of a CPAP, I think would be a good place to start. Um, so let me skip ahead a little bit and we'll come back to this. So what is the hackathon process? So essentially, I'm gonna show you a set of slides. There's really five steps, and maybe you'll walk away with what does a medical hackathon look like, and then maybe Donna and the group will, can send the link again of the Jefferson hack, because they have recorded it now both years, right? It's on the website, and I think it's really illustrative to watch the process from start to end. It's just a few minutes. Um, and that energy that you see in the video, for those of you that weren't there, it's real. Like the biggest thing that happens at a hackathon is not the prototypes that are made. Like one would imagine that, you know, folks are most excited that I built something. That's not it. What happens is it's the first time that a patient gets to sit down with a clinician 
and a nurse and an engineer from across town from a school and like work on a problem together. And there's no, you know, exam at the end of it. There's no money tied to the outcome other than prize money. And we'll talk about that. That's an incentive, I think, for students to come. Um, and so it's a very open conversation. And I think the most successful ones are the ones that have a good balanced ratio where there really is a patient that can go around and advise on a team or just frankly, a human being that knows somebody with that disease process. So um, the first thing that happens, and believe me, this is, so step one, you get to the hackathon, there's a big kickoff. I don't think any of us have the kickoffs that you all have at Jefferson with Donna. There's music, festivities, it's pretty incredible. They came two, three years ago to learn about the process and they really run with it. Um, and after the kickoff, the very next practical step that often happens like on a Saturday morning is people pitch their problems. So here's what's tough, right? And we just had this at Yale. We had it on imaging and radiology folks came. And you know, I love my fellow clinicians, but I had to prep them. You can only speak for 60 seconds and you cannot talk about your solution. You have to pitch the clinical pain point that you're trying to solve. For example, I Interventional radiologists spend much of my day trying to figure out which patients are on my schedule that day. And those two, three hours that I spend with changes going on could be better utilized by getting the patients in earlier because the wait time's really long. And then you have to stop there. You can't say, I would really like Epic to create a tool where, you know, and so it's very, very hard for us because we're all in the problem solving mode to think about new iterations but it's very easy for us to say in my daily life, what are the repetitive concerns that come up? And we have a series of that. And for those of you that have seen it, uh, the pitches can be pretty personal. People talk about their family or cancer survivors, um, but the pitches can also be very technical. We definitely always have some engineering students that bring super cool gadgets that they've wanted to make for a long time, and they're looking for clinical pull on you know, how could these be useful. And this is an example, and I actually included the slide on, on what happens because I think it's important for you guys to see the following. I think it's important for you to see that the socializing aspect, the part where you meet the other people, so I don't know, if this was a group and we were about to start a hackathon and our hackathon was gonna be on, I'm making it up, the design of the perfect patient room then if in this room we already had some patients, some engineers, this process of eating together and just getting to know each other and kind of understanding why you walked with your feet and are spending a weekend is the most important step. And a lot of times if that step is overlooked or if people come in the next day, so Friday night is often an opening and people say, well, I don't need to go to the, this is a classic clinician thing to do, we're very busy, I'm not gonna go Friday night, I'm gonna show up Saturday morning. But what happens is there's a lot of bonding and gelling that's going on, like you're already finding people you wanna work with. I mean, somehow you all chose the tables you sat at. And then you may have talked, hopefully, to one person at your table, right? So by Saturday morning, you've already in your mind said, gosh, I really wanna work with that guy. Like, he really seems to get it, and he knows how to program, which I think is often very important. So the Friday night becomes very important. And it's pretty amazing. Um, so I brought some live photos. I sort of instilled some photos from our recent Yale pitch. And it's really interesting to see folks on the Friday night and then you'll see them like, or the Saturday morning, you'll see them 24 hours later. And it's interesting to see the team evolve. This team was amazing. Um, this guy, the reason I put his eyes are closed here, he's been to like 40 hackathons. I think he'll be coming to yours. He's won at like, Stanford, MIT, like he came up to me and he said, this was a really good event, I'm a professional. And, um, and he's a nurse. He's a nurse from somewhere in DC or Virginia and he has found this community of people that wanna solve problems and it has led him to be on several projects and he's part of two startups right now. I just thought it was funny that like he knows how to pick a team, like you wanna hang with this guy on the Friday night. And then there's this moment of awkwardness. So if we think back to like high school, like the dance, right? Like basically the radiologists were all hanging together and 
I myself with other people, like John, were like, go out and mingle, go talk to other people. Um, it's not, and I'm picking on the radiologist, but I think it's the same. I think in, in healthcare in particular, we tend to get really siloed. We had some folks that were statisticians or you know, did, worked with data, and they only wanted to have a team of data people, because the data people would understand the data. But then that's not new, right? There's no fresh perspective there. So we actually have a mechanism. This is our mechanism. Everybody's labeled, and nobody wants to be labeled, called out with what they know, but here's the deal. You can put multiple dots on your badge, and essentially, a successful hackathon will have a nice grouping of these people, right? You need somebody to say, okay, but how's it gonna make money in the world? Who's gonna pay for it? And, but you also need somebody to say, it just technically doesn't make sense, or this is a great idea. We already use this in airlines. It's pretty simple. Let's go ahead and use it. I'll give you an example. It was pretty eye-opening for me to learn about optimization and the fact that, um, like raise your hand if you know anything about how an airline determines your seating. Right, it's weird, right? It's not arbitrary, we know that. We know like mileage and everything gets you like to the front of the plane, like that's definitely true. Um, but the other thing you have to know is airlines are trying to always move the number of physical seats in the plane based on that route and the volume so that if you notice, they, they, their goal is to have the plane as full as possible. Like they always tell us as passengers, oh my gosh, this flight is so full today, but that's actually what they want, right? So why don't we do that in an operating room? Like it was eye-opening to me to learn about optimization and data modeling when that process could work so well for patients that are being signed up for surgeries in the coming week at Jefferson Health System, for example. And maybe they do it, but we didn't do it at my old hospital. We had someone with pen and papers or a computer say, you know, you take two hours to do the surgery, this is your block, there you go. That's when you're gonna operate. Whereas if we optimize, I think less patients would be waiting hungry throughout the day, right? It would be like us sitting outside an airplane and the food is only served in the airplane, uh, which is not the case. So you would never learn that type of information unless you were engaging with people from different industries. And that's where I think in healthcare we could learn a lot from people that are in engineering or software. And I think a hackathon is a, like a collision course way to come there. And then here's some more uh, live photos. And again, Donna probably recognizes some of these spaces. But the other thing that happens at a hackathon is you have a group of people, you have a lot of junk food and coffee floating around, and then you have um, what is unusual, again, in a hospital setting or in a medical school setting, which is you start putting up poster board, you're getting some foam, um, you're using like Legos to prototype. To be honest, it's kind of the fun stuff that we used to do as children, right? So children that go to school, like preschool, are very creative. And there's a lot of studies that show that the more formal education we have, the less creative we become because we're taught structurally that we should have a polished presentation you know, in medical school and then present it to our attendings. And so this is the opposite. This is like, let's just get up and brainstorm until we all agree on the idea. And then we have Dr. Google, right? Let's quickly Google to make sure that we're not making something that already exists in the world. And so I think technology has really brought hackathons to a new level. And then these are just some more. These are live photos from last month. And I can't tell you, if I took the photo from Yale or Jefferson or MIT, they look the same. Like it's kind of amazing that within six hours of the event starting, people actually don't really want to talk to mentors because they're busy working. And then what the mentors do that's really, really important in the process is they come to you and say, like, what problem are you solving? And if you say, as some do, I'm solving health economics, then we get very worried. You need to narrow that problem. Okay, I'm solving Medicare access. No, too broad. Okay, I'm solving, like, in the state of Massachusetts, how people might be able to get their prescription medicines a little bit faster through an online platform. Okay, love it. At least we can kind of put our arms around that problem. And now, have you talked to anyone? And the usual answer initially is no. Well, who do you need to talk to? And often we hear back, 
patients, but actually no, you could talk to anyone that has Medicare. So call your parents, say, can I talk to some of your friends that are older? So it's interesting, we, um, in Singapore, we literally said, uh, for you to do a hackathon on aging, you have to actually talk to people who are older. And they said, okay, so they sent them an email. And they said, where do we find those? I said, do you have grandparents? <laughs> and they're very formal. It's a very formal system of education. And they thought that was so untoward that they would just call up older people and ask them questions. So then, no joke, we brought some grandparents in and said, all right, ask them your questions. And immediately what happened was, you know, the one group that had engineered a contraption and thought, elderly are gonna love this, they're gonna like wear this and it's gonna light up. And they were like, we're not gonna do that. We don't wanna be pointing out our dementia, our memory loss, our walking disability. So I think, what is that really saying? I mean, again, it's not a magic mystery what we're doing at a hackathon during the hacking phase. It's really human-centered design. And I know that at Jefferson, you guys are really focusing on that. Oh, and the med students are nodding. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, let's go back to designing for the receiver of healthcare, not necessarily the provider of healthcare. It's very convenient for me to go to the same building to do my surgery and go to my clinic and send my patients to the oncologist. But if that building is Mass Eye or downtown, it's not so convenient for the patient because there's no parking. So, I mean, that's human-centered design, like sort of ask a patient, walk me through how you get chemotherapy and, and let me understand why you don't show up. Oh, you don't show up because literally it's death-defying to park in Boston around that spiral near MGH. So, those are the kinds of things that come up, and then the kids think about it. So the last couple of slides I'll talk about are hack do's and hack don'ts. The do's we've talked about. Leave job titles at the door. We have been, folks like Donna have come, Bon has come, and they have been very humble, right? Teams have no idea that somebody is the president of a company or the dean of a university. They're, they're a person. I guess I should talk about the dress code. So at hackathons, people wear jeans. And so I think a lot of the clinicians and company folks love it because they don't have to get dressed up for the weekend, right? But then what that does is you can't imagine what a great equalizer that is because if people are casually dressed, they just assume that they're less important. I, I don't know, it's just sort of a human nature. And so the students, I think, are less nervous about talking to like the president of GE services and ultrasound versus if they were meeting him in the office and asking him the same question. So I think the mentors and the sponsors play a really, really big role in that. But then here's the thing not to do. And for those of you, I guess I'm essentially doing a plug for your next hackathon. For those of you that do come, this is hard. This one, the monopolize the conversation because you're gonna have an undergrad and they're gonna say, I'm gonna solve screening for breast cancer using mammography. I'm an electrical engineer. I looked at the mammograms. I looked at the way it's done and I can do it better. And then as a breast cancer oncologist, you're gonna say, you don't even know the first thing about breast cancer. Let me tell you. The problem is the whole weekend could go by teaching someone about the nuances of different types of breast cancer. And so a lot of times what we tell the mentors and the teams is that you want the cl clinical folks to define the problem, but you don't want them to lead you down the path of what already exists and only focus on the things that aren't possible. Because we do have a tendency to do that, to say that's just hard. We had, again, true statement, number one problem identified by radiology was not, as people suspected, high-end imaging protocols for chemotherapeutic regimens because Yale is very well known for doing injection uh, procedures. It was scheduling. It was, I call the hospital and I can't get someone on the phone to schedule my test. See, they're calling the hospital right now <laughs> and no one's gonna answer. Um, and as we're sitting in a planning meeting, we had one of the IT heads for the department and he said, it's a problem, but it's so hard I don't even think we should tackle it. And I thought to myself, we're gonna have to get him on board before this event starts because that's exactly what happens, right? We all know that's a dilemma. 
We all know that patients hate that type of stuff where they can't get somebody on the phone to, but we know that I could change my airline ticket in a heartbeat, like on my smartphone, but there is no way I can get my children a well child visit, like at MGH Pediatric. Like it's, a, it's going to take 40 minutes out of my day. And you know what, that is a simple set of solutions, but maybe not in the right order. And in order to do it right, what we responded with was bring your schedulers to the event. And they said, what? We're bringing radiologists, we're bringing the IT, we're bringing the scientists. I said, no, bring the techs. You know, the people that sit there that run the CAT scanner, bring them. Because they're the ones that fit people in. And they know the tricks and the workarounds. And instead of being a workaround, let them sit at the hackathon and make that part of the new process. And I think that's where the more you talk to the people that do the physical functioning in and around the health system, the more you'll learn about how they do that process. Um, so, so that was actually really interesting. This is what jo Donna's job was, the giving the feedback. I can tell you most of the time, there's only 24 to 36 hours, the mentors get a genius bar, the teams present, they sort of get hammered with questions, they go back, and then there's prizes to win and the judging criteria and they don't want to talk to the mentors and the poor mentors are like, we're here, we're ready, we're excited. So it's kind of a balance. I think to be successful as a coach or a mentor like anything else, you want to inspire them and then you want to like let them run with it. Uh, would you guys agree? I think the med students have, uh, have been to some of these events. Yeah, he's like, no, we don't want to talk a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what, how do you win? And winning is important because there's money involved. I think I put that here. This is in pounds, just to be cool, or euros. Um, we've got it in all kinds of currency. Donna, you guys had unbelievable prizes. I went back and said, they've really spoiled kids because they had several thousand dollars worth of prizes. Um, this is important. Innovation, you're not surprised, right? What wins a hackathon is some, a new way to approach something, but it doesn't have to be a tool. It can even be a process change. Uh, that one's not surprising. Impact is not surprising. Presentation, I cannot emphasize to you enough. The teams that practice, does anybody know how many minutes you have to present this? Yeah, three, exactly. And you know where that number came from? Nowhere, we just made it up. <laughs> and so we, uh, we came up with this system. I mean, who wants to listen to folks for 25 minutes, right? And so if you think about TED Talks, they're six to 10 minutes, right? And yet, I had never been to a grand rounds presentation that was less than 45 minutes, even one that like I'm giving. And if you think about it, we, we tune out. So the hackathon presentations, we made three, maybe four, maybe two. We've, this was hard in Singapore. They were shocked. And then two minutes, we clap you off. The teams that win tend to be the ones that practice presenting. And we all know, again, that's human nature. Sometimes we see ideas that are much better, but like anything else in life, presentation skills really go a long way. But the one that I mentioned at the beginning, and I'm gonna say it again, is the sustainable business model. Is there any discussion within the team over the weekend on who might potentially be interested in bringing it to life? You don't have to figure it out. But if you say, we're not worried about any sort of business model because we think that and you can insert, the nurse will just do it, the doctor will just do it, the patient will want to use this to track their diabetes. That's where we think, okay, maybe you haven't gone out and asked these people because they, no, none of these uh, stakeholders want more things to do unless it's gonna help them with their day. So I think that's very important. And then here they're iterating. Um, it can get intimidating. I think Donna, the grand hack at MIT, I should talk about numbers, successful hackathons within departments and institutions can often be 50 to 150 people. I think that's solid. Um, we run one that's 450 people. It's ridiculous. Um, and when you're presenting in front of 150 people, it's also intimidating. Um, and we do get up and have them present in the media lab. However, I think, I think it's amazing that people stay for the weekend and sit for the presentations and that they're interested. And we often find that, and of course money helps, this is the pitching. And then that might be it. Um, the la so, so what do I wanna leave you with? Well, I wanna leave you with the following. Hackathons are not new. They've been happening um, in the software industry 
in the airline industry, in pharmaceuticals. Um, they happen every day in a preschool. Like, I'm gonna highlight that again. The most creative thinking about education shows that the more school we go to, the less creative we become. We are beat down to sort of do what we're taught. And then the second thing I'm going to say is uh, you can't, it's really impossible to describe. Like you can watch the video. You kind of just have to go to one. And especially if you work in healthcare, you, you may have danger of becoming that guy, the nurse. I can't remember his name that traveled, which is a little scary. I think all his vacation time is burned on that. But I think if you go to one, you might meet some really cool people who are also interested in sort of making a change around them. And I think social progress always happens when groups of people like that get together. So thank you. So um, I just want to add a couple of comments to, uh, to Aisha's presentation. Uh, obviously, we learned a lot from going to the hackathon, and it was inspirational to think that you know, these guys are really pulling this off, and now we're going to go back to Jefferson, take all this learning back with us, and convert it into a really cool event. And I'm, you know, for anybody who came to the first hackathon, I mean, we had a drone track. I, when I told Aisha we were doing it, she's like, I don't think anybody's ever done that before. <laughs> so we had a drone flying around inside Alumni Hall, and that, and and it's a long story about what the drone track ended up doing. But it was it was it was pretty amazing and pretty cool. We did wearables. Um, and we partner with NextFab, which is the fabrication uh, and prototyping laboratory in South Philadelphia at 20 in Washington. And we take people back and forth in Ubers and vans, and people go and prototype their, their, their team ideas, and saw some pretty amazingly cool things in, in both hackathons. Um, you know I will what I didn't mention? Let me mention one thing. I should have said this at the beginning. I think this is true for your event as well. These are volunteer-run events. So unlike everything else that happens in the world of healthcare, conferences, sales meetings, society meetings, these are like undergrads, clinicians, um, medical students, I think huge participation at Jefferson, who, get, who in our case gave up a Monday evening for three months straight to just sit together and plan the hack. And in MIT's case, there's like 25. I think that's a big deal. I think it's it the same for you, right? It is. We, it's a really big deal. I mean, and we have two of the leaders from the last hack. Rob Puglis managed large, large chunks of the hack from, from both behind the scenes and then from the stage over the weekend along with Glenn and others. And, and my job is to just make, it, make the opening fun, you know, so it's light shows and music and Clasco on stage dancing. You know, it's the usual mix of, of extraordinarily crazy. But, but that's what makes Jefferson sort of the cool place to do this. We tried, in addition to the things that MIT did, to um, modify some of the things that we mm -hmm. learned about. So for example, in mentoring, one of the things that we realized mm -hmm. was that the mentoring skills that people need on Sunday morning before they go to present are presentation skills. Mm -hmm. So we, I corralled Michael Hode, <laughs> who is one of the most superb communicators in the business, into mentoring, and um, one of the teams he coached uh, won first prize in their track. Wow. So, so we tried to fine tune at least a little yep. bit so that the mentors that were available on Sunday morning were the mentors that were gonna be most relevant to what was gonna happen next. So on Saturday, the mentoring was much more substantive, so we tried to make substantive mentors available in, in, in a number of different areas. We also tried to do fun stuff and cool stuff. So the first year we did, I don't know if I told you this, we did vegetarian lunches. Yes. And people were like, what? Yeah. Ah. And then they ate them and they were like, hey, this is pretty good. Yeah. So, so we were committed to not only caffeine mm -hmm. and junk food, but we were trying to do healthy hack. Mm -hmm. So we tried to feed people healthy stuff. We did, I mean, plenty this year of caffeine. We had, we had at caffeine. Yale, we, we, so when you ask for feedback, it's really interesting because if you think about um, the fact that we're in the clinical community, we had, to, we had options that were gluten-free. Um, you know, we, you wanted to have vegetarian, but you also wanted to have dairy-free and gluten-free because you didn't want somebody to say, which had happened to us in the past, I have to leave the event to go find things that I can ingest and eat during the weekend. Um, but I think you raise a role that the healthcare hackathons have tended to be healthier than the sort of chips and soda hackathons where they're coding all night. We also, um, at the first hackathon and the second, we did, uh, we did uh, uh, workout breaks. So we had 
yoga and Zumba and kickboxing. This year, though, we did, and I think I told you about this, we did neck massages, which went over big. So uh, we anticipate more neck massages in the future. <laughs> um, so for those of you who are thinking about a hack this coming fall, if you haven't done one, please join us. Um, when is your hack at MIT? I can't believe it's I don't. May it's, something. Yeah, yeah, it's right at the beginning. Yeah. We'll, we'll tweet it out. Yes, yeah, we'll so we'll, 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 we'll get you the, uh, the MIT um, hack information. But um, we, we've, Aisha has a little bit of time for questions. So who, who has a question? Here, right yeah. in the front. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, what, how can you characterize teams that form in a hackathon with an idea? Which ones are more likely to continue into a startup? Yeah, I don't know if there's a rhyme or a reason. Well, we do have some metrics. So um, teams that win are not generally the teams that succeed. So that says something about our, us all as judges, right? Um, it's usually the team that comes in second place or third place. Um, secondly, it's the teams that are really open, really diverse. Ideal teams are four to six people. So I think you can put a number on that. Sometimes you'll see a team of 15. We're all friends. We all want to stick together but like work groups, that makes it hard. Um, teams that do not succeed have like two or three of the same people. By that I mean like three engineers or three clinicians. That team probably won't do as well. Uh, the most successful teams have either an engineer or a developer, one or the other on them in order to build things. I think in total we're at about 90 million for money raised. I could be wrong, it could be higher from the MIT events, but I think it's not just the money raised, it's also, did you get a grant? Did you get an SBIR? Did you get a foundation to fund you? Um, did, for a lot of students, they end up getting internships in healthcare companies. So I think it's hard to measure, but I think money is, is one measurement. Yes. Thank you very much for your <clears throat> presentation. I have a two-part question that refers to scalability mm -hmm. and transferability. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say the audience we'd like to gather, the human dynamics you describe are incredible. Let's say we have an audience we want to get together oh, and hack. Right. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, let's say the audience uh, is, um, let's say they might get grumpy and irritable rather than creative and interactive if we try to keep them up all night and feed them. Oh, yeah. You know. so, yeah. so to what extent is the style and dynamics scalable to a shorter time frame or some other? And the transferability goes to uh, there are many things here that challenge us that are not necessarily patient-centered. So mm -hmm. I also presume that in mm -hmm. terms of the general dynamic mm -hmm. scheme, this is applicable to uh, a, a curriculum design yes. and whatever it might be that's not necessarily uh, on the clinical side of an academic health center. Yeah, so I'm going to hit your second question first, then I'll go back to the first one. Uh, so I think it's not just for an academic health center, it's for maybe a four-person practice, right? I think that there's any type of healthcare setting has dilemmas that you can put in. Um, from curriculum design, it's interesting that you say that because I'm in the process right now. We have a meeting on Monday to talk about user-centered design, how people learn, and the School of Public Health engaging with the art and engineering schools at Yale to really think about like putting a design-centered hack in the fall, but it's not around making tools or products, it's actually around like how do we best learn for our students in the future. I think the, the, the process is similar. As to the staying up all night, that's actually really important. We actually don't encourage staying up all night. We try physically as hard as we can late in the evening to push people out the door because guess what happens if they stay all night, as Donna will attest, you have to stay with them. Jefferson doesn't like just bunches of people from anywhere in the world, I'm sure, traversing their buildings. Um, so we definitely tell mentors, team members, clinicians, there is no reason that you have to be here uh, all night. What, what I think works well is you're there during the day. Sometimes you give your cell phone and say, I'm going to go home, be with the family, have dinner, call me if you have a question, and then come the next morning. So it's usually Saturday during the day maybe till 6 or 7 p.m., and then Sunday morning till the afternoon, and you might have had a mixer. I think that becomes very reasonable. I will tell you a funny story. One of the heads of the patient council, he's come to three. He's come to three consecutive ones. He stayed all night at the first one because he thought he had to. And he said, it was really great, guys, but I'm, you know, 62 years old, and I stayed all night. And, like, do I have to do that? And we were like, 
you really don't have to do that. Um, I think that it's not fair to ask those of us that have other professional obligations to, to be up for an entire weekend. So we actually have really played with that. Um, but I'll tell you, the coders stay, and you like can't kick them out, and then we just leave them with a sleeping bag and come back in the morning. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Is it on? I hear a voice. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, the language around the invitation for the Jefferson Hackathon was really great because it was like, you know, even if you're curious about what's yes. going on. Please come, you know, if you have any, you know, it doesn't have to be from healthcare if you have a problem that you want to solve. Yep. Um, what I encountered, though, was um, some people that were a little overwhelmed by the technology aspect of it, and we had yeah. kind of a hard time finding a good team for them to fit in. Is that something that you've encountered? Like, what's some advice yeah. that you can give those people to try to integrate them in without, you know, they don't come with any coding experience, barely any um, technical experience, yes. but they have really good um, clinical experience. So it's funny, right? Because that is the classic, you're basically drilling down at a larger scale what is already a problem in the world, which is clinical folks have a lot of value because we provide the clinical insight into the problems that need to be solved, just like patients. Um, technical folks, if you look at any medical device or pharma company or uh, an engineering firm, they're pretty sure that they're creating a really cool solution that you're gonna wanna use. I think the goal there, so we do set some limits, like for example, like physically, we will go up to teams and say, I'm sorry, four of you, I, can, I already know, because remember, we've pre-vetted the registration, so a lot of times they'll say, no, we're not, we're not, we don't know each other. We're like, oh, you do, because you all applied and you're all from the same school and you're all engineers, so we gotta split you apart. Remember, even though the technical folks may seem uninviting, that is often because they are also nervous about the other way around, right? And I feel that a lot of times the clinicians or the patients feel like they're imposing, but remember that people in technical fields are used to being given something, like I'm a coder, I get code, I sit down, I do it. Like I don't usually then talk to people about it as I'm doing so. I think it works both ways. I think the facilitation, the socialization, like Friday night and late Saturday morning is really important. I, I even said this to my organizers at Yale this year. Um, they wanted to rush it. Okay, teams are formed. I said, I feel like we should spend the most time on that because the rest of the weekend rolls out really well. Yes. So, so just uh, let me just add uh, comments to, and thank you for that good feedback, that lovely feedback on the welcoming language. We actually worked pretty hard on that. We would go over the language over and over again to make sure that we were conveying the maximum welcoming messaging uh, so that if you weren't a coder, you were welcome to come and that we weren't expecting you know, everyone to be coding. And in fact, we did get coders, but, but there, was, there wasn't an overwhelming number. But I wanna say something about something Aisha just referenced on the subject of, of people that show up together and they've kind of already gotten a head start. Um, the first year that we went up to MIT, I remember Bon was really upset because he observed that there were teams mm -hmm. that had already been working together. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, this long conversation about how do we manage that? Because yeah. on the one hand, you don't wanna discourage people that are working on something great. And on the other hand, you don't want to be uh, put other people at a disadvantage. So what we did on our website is we were transparent about what we called preformed teams. Mm -hmm. So we said you can be part of a you can come as a preformed team, but you have to take other people. Right. You cannot exclusively have your team and push other people out. So as long as you were okay with that, and we would we would note, you know, yes, this team is preformed, and if you are interested in joining this preformed team, this is the person you can contact. So on the one hand, we want to maximize the idea that people are hacking in their day-to-day -day life and figuring out uh, uh, ways of dealing with with healthcare problems, and they want to bring that 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 knowledge and 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 uh, already pre-developed concepts but you can't leave other people out. So mm -hmm. it has to be, you know, it has to be very egalitarian. 
you know, if you're showing up with uh, something that you've already worked on, you've got to let other people join your team. And that, that was how we coped with it. But it's, it's, yeah. a, it's tricky. It's a, it's I a tricky issue. I should say two other things. Let's say we've given you guys this great plug and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go sign up. Um, in general, after the first year, and I'm sure this is true for you guys, applications shoot up for these types of events. And there is actually a fairly significant rejection rate. And it's greater than 50% for the MIT event. But of course, just email me if anybody here wants to come, <laughs> which they always get mad. They're like, I should have invited like 100 people. Now we can only invite like 300 others. But um, even this year at Yale, you know, the one thing we do say is make the commitment of the time. And that's actually hard for clinical folks. Like they often say, I'm going to show up for like two hours, but I want to participate. We're, and we flatly say, no, you don't have to stay, but you also can't be a surgeon on call that weekend and be in the, you know, move the call. I know about that. So I think, I think we try to set expectations. I think the goal is if you're there, you're there in spirit. You don't have to be physically there, but your mind is thinking about solving these problems. And then I think putting the effort to the facilitation pays off versus if everybody comes and 80% leave and don't come back for the rest of the weekend, it's really hard for the 20% that are remaining. So if it feels like you apply to one, definitely ask. The other secret rule of hackathon acceptance, like anything else in life, just ask again. You know, in our first wave, we tell a bunch of people you're on the wait list. And honestly, the people that keep emailing, okay, but I just, like really want to come. Let me tell you another reason why I really need to come. We let them in, right? Because it's like anything else in life. Boy, this person really wants to come and they're traveling from, we had someone traveling from Italy, right? At Yale, we had like two guys from Hungary. I don't know, they really wanted to come and a guy from India. And he had a lot of trouble with the embassy and then I had to get on the phone with the embassy, which seemed very suspicious because he was bringing technology on the plane and they were not happy. But man, that kid really wanted to come. So we got him there. Um, but I think he only got in because he sent more than one email. And I think, you know, I'm not saying harass the organizers, but I'm saying just take initiative and you should be able to get in. So, so we didn't have to turn anybody away, but this past year we had 350 people sign up, which was way beyond the first year, which was a little over 200. Um, and, but part of that was because one of the tracks that we did was AR, VR, virtual reality. Oh, right. And yes, yeah, so, right. and we had a bunch of vendors to the credit of our medical students. Um, I, I, there was, a, some of you will remember this. Um, there was an event at the Franklin Institute on alternative, on, um, on virtual reality. And so, um, and they, they had a bunch of vendors there. So I, I, I slacked all of the students on our Slack page that were working on this and said, if any of you want to go to this, I'll pay for the ticket and see if you can recruit some of these <laughs> vendors to come to our hack so that we have more VR opportunities for people to learn about what, what can happen. Oh. So we had, we that's had like how you six, got HoloLens. That's how we got them. And yeah. then and, I got and HoloLens. And Anthony, Anthony Sorrentino, who was one of, our, one of our colleagues in the pillar, he also went. And um, yeah, we had like five or six vendors. So, um, so, so we did have people show up that just wanted to do that. They just wanted the exposure to VR, so we let mm. them stay. We, we, mm -hmm. we, we're, not, we're not as rigorous at MIT yeah, I know, they're yet. Softies. Yeah, they're softies, they're <laughs> softies. Um, we used, actually, it's a great opportunity for vendors, companies, um, because we've shared them. So the same HoloLens people that came to your hack came to the Yale hack, and I'm teaching a class right now on medical software design, and I invited them as a guest lecturer, because I feel like they spent the effort, right? They come for the weekend. They're a small company that's burgeoning and they're clearly interested in medical education, to your question. Um, so I've brought them to Yale and I'm gonna bring them to Boston and just introduce them because it is a pretty small community. Um, and then, you know, we heard from Donna that they're great. And so imagine I walk into the Yale hack, Neil Gomes, one of our colleagues, is also on his <laughs> way. And I walk in and here are these guys from Philadelphia that have this. Uh, that, they that had their it. cool glasses. Yeah, Everybody yeah, loved doing, it. They were doing their 3D thing. And it was like, hey, how you doing? It was like, oh my god, OK. And they're all showing up. Yes. You're going back and forth between MIT and Yale. Yes. There, it's just me. I, I work at both. <laughs> so I graduated from the program at MIT and helped found the Hacking Medicine Institute. And one of the goals of our institute, which is a spin-off, 
is to try to build bridges and collaboration across institutions because honestly, at every healthcare system, there's, there's the rebels, right, and the rabble rousers that wanna think about new ways of doing things. And so I currently work part-time at Yale at one of the institutes, specifically running their innovation events and meeting their, their clinicians. Anybody else have any final questions before we, we release Aisha? Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you so much, Aisha, it was great. And if I could just mention one more time, for those of you that are interested in Jazz Tank, um, it's a little bit of a variation of a hackathon. Uh, we're happy to give you the details. You can look at it on the website. Um, our, our, my colleagues, Robin, Sheldon, and, and Michael, and others are here. So uh, please think about doing it. It's, it's a blast. It's, a, it's our variant of Shark Tank. And if you're wondering why we didn't call it Shark Tank, it's because they patented the, they trademarked the, the, uh, the name. So we didn't want to get sued. We thought that wasn't really a good way to get started. But thank you all for coming for another, uh, another speaker series event. Thanks.